So we have an election coming up. General election. And to quote Billy Graham in 1952, he said, I think it's the duty of every individual Christian at election time to study the issues, study the candidates, and then go to the polls and vote. And myself, I'd like to add to study the platforms. Study the platforms now of each party because there is a big difference. So today we'll be reading from Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13 will be verses 1 through 7. We will also be reading 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 13 through 17. That's Romans chapter 13. And in this passage, the Apostle Paul is speaking about submission to authorities, to government. So hear now the word of the Lord. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that, have, that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong, do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God, for he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why we pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Now, from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. And the caption on this is submission to rulers and masters. Verse 13. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to command those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use freedom as a cover-up for evil live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the king. So say it the word of the Lord. Amen. 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 So, you have some Christians, some people, period, you say that pastors and churches should not have an opinion or address any politics. Some say religious leaders should stay neutral when it comes to elections. Now, how boring is that? I mean, come on. <laughs> come on now. Some seminaries are teaching, you know, future pastors to be neutral, choose no sides. And I think a lot of that is just to avoid with a lot of confrontation and uneasy feelings in the churches, you know? But there's also a risk of being neutral. There's a big risk. And I'll go on to explain. But my first question is, how do you think we got to where we are as pastors in America now? How did we get here? It certainly isn't because we're silent. 
Those who came before us took great risks, both physically and financially, in order to be free. They crossed the ocean. You know, November 11th, 2020 is not only Veterans Day, but it's going to be the 400th year anniversary of Plymouth Rock. 400 years. America, as we know it, has been serving God, reaching out to him. You see, New England during the 17th and 18th centuries, it was expected that ministers would preach on election day, or they would preach an election day sermon. It was expected of them. This was unlike the Church of England. The king ruled, and the king would dictate to the Church of England to preach only to please and inspire. To please and inspire only. In the 1600s and 1700s, first pastors asserted there was an agreement between God, agreement between God and citizens to establish a political system that promotes the common good, the common good amongst men and women. We find this assertion in our Constitution today in our Bill of Rights. I argue, I argue, our system of government was first formed and crafted by congregations of churches, by the people. It certainly was influenced, that's for sure. Scripture tells us, we just read it, that government is necessary. But no system is perfect. No system is perfect. And, you know, when this was written, the Apostle Paul wrote this during the Roman, you know, the rule of the Roman Empire. Cruel. Harsh. So much different than what we have today in America. Now, voters, people, back in the 1600s, 1700s, were duty-bound. Sounds English, right? Duty-bound. They were duty-bound to obey rulers as long as rulers acted in proper character. Follow biblical rules, laws, ethics. Now, on the other hand, if rulers acted contrary to the terms of the agreement or terms of government of ethical behavior, voters had the duty bound to resist them. In all civic actions, rulers and voters were charged to promote virtue. Promote virtue. Suppress vice. And support people of brutal wisdom, integrity, justice, and holiness. That's how our system of government started. And in doing so, one must be careful not to bear false witness against one's neighbor because that neighbor might be using the same measure in making a different decision. <laughs> right? Freedom of choice. Humans have had that freedom of choice since the beginning, since Adam and Eve. Yeah, we make mistakes, we all know that. But it's still the freedom, the freedom of choice. And I ask, what's wrong with the pursuit of life? With the pursuit of life itself, with liberty and happiness? Look how long and how much we've come from 1620 to 2020 now. And the neutrality from pulpits brings forth more government control. You know, I like Thomas Paine saying that government at its best is a necessary evil. A necessary evil. I'm not anti-government. I'm told not to be, too, okay? I'm told to obey the authorities here as a good Christian. And even in Matthew 22, Jesus Christ said, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. In other words, pay your taxes to Caesar. Pay your taxes to the government. And give to God what is God's.
An unchecked government leads. Unchecked power leads to death and destruction. We see that throughout history. We've seen that evil rear its ugly head in the killing fields of the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. The ovens of Auschwitz. The mass graves in Croatia. And that was 1995. That's not that long ago. And the killing sprees of Mao and Stalin. And Stalin their Marxist beliefs. In every instance of these, at some point, the church and the pastors were neutral within their own governments, within their own nations. And I don't tell anybody how to vote. And I don't tell anybody what party they should belong to or what party they should support. But I do tell Christians it's my responsibility as a pastor to be good stewards. We must educate ourselves. Educate what platforms. I mean, really, I guess what I'm saying is, you know what, remove the candidates. Remove the candidates, really. Well, I don't like the way he does this, or I don't like the way he stays in his base. Whatever, remove all of that, okay? Look at party platforms. Look at the party platforms, because not only on a national presidential election, you'll also have congressional elections. You'll also have local elections. Look at the party platform. Apply it to the Bible, biblical principles. Three things, religious freedom, the life itself, and freedom, a constitution. The start with religious freedom. The Republican platform endorses the Bill of Rights as it is written. And they endorse First Amendment Defense Act, which further protects faith-based institutions and individuals from government discrimination. The Democrat platform states they celebrate America's history of religious pluralism and tolerance. Pluralism and tolerance. Mm -hmm. Pluralism within itself is a great nebulous matter of religion. Intolerance. Instead of embracing, you tolerate it, right? It's there. It's And they reject the use of the broad exemption. Okay, broad exemption. Meaning, they'll define what is good for you, what is good for churches. They'll determine what they'll allow in businesses, medical providers, social service agencies, and others. They will give preference to LGBTQ rights in cases of religious exercise, conscious conflict, and sexual interpretations. So what's that mean, right? So if you earn or you, you, you earn your living and own a wedding cake business and you decide that it conflicts with your religious beliefs to make a wedding cake for a gay wedding under the Democrat platform, your business will be sued or rightfully so. You'll be put out of business for discrimination when it conflicts with your own religious views. Also consider the long-term closings of churches by Democrat governors and mayors in American lawsuits. Next subject, life. Life itself. Abortion. Republicans affirm that the unborn child has a fundamental right of life which cannot be infringed upon. The GOP supports human life amendment requiring informed consent, parental consent, waiting periods, and clinic regulation. They also support ending funding for international abortions. The Democratic platform favors unrestricted access, liberal regulations to abortion clinics. Congressional Democrats have repeatedly, repeatedly defeated born alive protection bills and supported funding international abortion clinics. Next, our Constitution, our freedoms that we enjoy. The Republican platform supports the Constitution, the Bill of Rights as is written. The appointment of judges who support interpretation of the Constitution as is written, not legislating from the bench. Democratic Party supports Black Lives Matter organization. 
they support that organization, which is a Marxist organization. Black Lives Matter organization calls for violence, lawlessness. They seek to dismantle the biblical definition of the family. They champion their own homosexuality. They despise Christianity and they want to end it. And Christians have a deep spiritual reason to resist aligning with this movement. But I've said before and I'll say it again, Christians only bow or take a knee to God. Not a Marxist social justice movement sponsored by BLM. A little story for you. Growing up, I grew up in a democratic household. My grandma, obviously, loved her to death. Um, she was she was really a working woman ahead of her time, and it came I don't know. It, don't quote me on this. I'm sure my sister will correct me. But 1963-64, she was appointed to be a postmaster in the U.S. Post Office. Great. Well, one of the conditions is that she had to register as a Republican. So this really, <laughs> this really <laughs> ate at my grandmother. So the rest of her working life, she was so opposed to Republicans. Just... She made no bones about it. And so my mom, my mom became a postmaster and was pro-Democrat. And I understand, I understand why. And I don't blame them one bit. You know, I came up with this, with this structure for this sermon Tuesday night about 1.30 a.m. Could not sleep. Tossing, and turning. Got up in the middle of the, month, of the night. And I sat there with a pen in my hand thinking about this sermon. I feel as though I have something to say. How do you say it? How do you come across? So, you know, I, I sat there and I, I looked out the window in the darkness and I was like talking to my grandma. Yeah, I know it's weird, you know, okay. My grandma, you know, I said, do you think I should vote for a party who, a party who favors late-term abortions and after-birth death infanticide? The pastors won't speak out against that. Uh, what good are we? Grandma, should I vote for political party that favors giving puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones to children who suffer from gender dysphoria, confusion. Should I vote for a party that supports neutral gender bathrooms, locker rooms, and non-gender sports? Should I vote for a party that sues the little sisters of the poor for not obeying Obamacare's contraceptive directive. Not only did they sue them once in the Supreme Court and lost once, but then 24 states came back and tried to sue them again, and they won again. I mean, come on. Should I vote for a party who favors sexual impur impurity and promotes it? Should I vote for a party that favors Black Lives Matter organization and is suddenly quiet about their support during the election season? Should I vote for a party that favors the closing of churches until further notice under the guise of public safety? I vote for a party who favors imprisoning pastors and church leaders for going against their one-sided decrees for public safety, suing churches. John MacArthur in L.A., had to sue in order to keep his, his church open. Even though they obeyed all the social rules, social distancing, the whole thing. Thank God he had the resources to do it. Thank God people gave to the church. Should I vote for a party that was silent as violence spread across this nation in June? As protesters violent protesters ruined, businesses looted, 
destroyed churches in historical sites. Should I vote for a party that favors violence against people who dare wear MAGA hats, t-shirts, and other types of clothing? It's gonna be me next with a cross, a pastor cross on my shirt, that they'll attack? <laughs> yeah. Just because you oppose something doesn't give you the right to beat the hell out of somebody. Imagine if we didn't have our Constitution for voting. Imagine that. Wow. That's a sobering thought right there. Vote for a party. Should I vote for a party that favors socialism government over our democracy as it is now? You know, as Karl Marx, I spent the past four weeks reading the Communist Manifesto. And that thing is designed to implode upon itself because it's always rebelling against authority, which is not biblical. To burn history, to wipe out a nation's history. And Karl Marx said socialism is just a step to communism, which is just another step to total Marxism. And we see that in history. People claim they're doing this for social justice and equality. Social justice and equality is right here. Jesus Christ was the ultimate example. The gospel is not a white man's gospel. The gospel is not a black man's gospel. It's a gospel for every living human being. That's why Christ died on the cross for each and every one of us. Remember, death levels the playing field. We're all equal. So I'll leave you. I'll leave with this verse. I love this verse. I read it, you know, the past couple weeks, and I just, I like it for this time. We read it today. 1 Peter 2, 16. Live as free people. Live as free people. Do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I pray that this nation remains free one nation under God and that we do indeed use our freedom for goodness for the goodness of society and our culture overall I pray that we do not use our freedom to cover up evil that we are good stewards of what you have entrusted us and what has been our way for 400 years I pray this in your holy name Amen.